thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, we're really privileged and excited to have uh, Dr. Lauren Williams and Dr. Tara Jane Clark, um, both psychologists, um, here to talk about supporting mental health in response to, to COVID-19. Both Lauren and Tara have extensive experience working with people and families affected by cancer, so we're really excited to, to have you both here today. And we really wanted to make a, a, a short video, um, not too long, not too complex, but really to uh, start, the, start the conversation about how people who might be feeling a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more at risk can can do to both help themselves and to seek um, further support, further psychological support um, if uh, if needed. So thanks, uh, thank you, thank you so much for for both of you for joining us today. Thanks, Andy. Thank you for giving Lauren and I the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, what this has been and continues to be a really challenging time for everyone, but we're keenly aware of the potential increased stress of vulnerable health population, such as the oncology community. What we really wanted to let people know is that it's really normal to have lots of mixed emotions at this time. Sadness about social isolation or not being able to engage in previously enjoyed activities. Confusion, trying to keep up with the ever-changing recommendations or generally about what's going on in the world. Mostly what we're hearing is anxiety or worry about people's own health or health of their loved ones. At the same time, also wanting to acknowledge that people are also experiencing positive emotions as a result of this, such as increased gratitude with being able to spend more time with the loved ones in their homes or being able to reevaluate priorities. But the experience of having all these mixed emotions can leave people feeling incredibly overwhelmed. And what we really wanted to address today is how people might be able to manage these big feelings and how they might be able to access further support if they need them at this time. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Tara. Lauren, I might, I might throw to you, Tara mentioned, um, Tara mentioned worry and, and, and anxiety. Um, do you have any ideas, tips or suggestions on, on how people might might manage um, those worries or those those anxiety, that anxiety that they might be feeling in, in this moment? Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing to say um, before I get into strategies is that obviously when our minds detect some kind of danger or threat coming up, that, that does activate our nervous system and that can lead to lots of changes in our body. So often people describe to me a real tightness or heaviness in their chest or um, increased heart rate, um, feeling breathless or feeling a bit nauseous, dizzy, that sort of thing. It can also lead to changes, particularly with sleep, is one that I hear a lot of can be impacted um, when our nervous system is activated. Um, and at the same time, you know, a lot of people are describing a lot of worry or thinking ahead um, because we just really don't know what the future holds. Um, we're really unclear exactly how things are going to turn out. And one thing we do know is that our brains do love certainty. Um, and, you know, I think many of the worries that people are reporting that people are experiencing, particularly for those who are really vulnerable, are actually very real and very valid. They're not, they're not worries that, you know, we can necessarily argue with or tell people, you know, don't worry, um, don't stress, um, stay calm. This is really not helpful because you know, we're talking about a group of people who are more vulnerable, who, you know, if they if they do become unwell, that can be more serious than, you know, for many other people. Um, I'm thinking, I suppose, as well, about worries as being quite helpful. So they do actually help us plan ahead with situations that we can't avoid, like attending medical um, appointments, for example. So I think three things that might be helpful for people to take away and, and, and try at home um, would be firstly to just acknowledge that the stress and anxiety is showing up uh, and to focus on what you can do in a situation. So the more that we focus on things that are not in our control, the more anxious and worried we will feel. We do know that we can't really control our thoughts or our feelings or how our body responds. Um, so we need to really focus on what we can do and what we can control. So things like connecting with others, other loved ones um, where possible, and, you know, really pursuing hobbies and interests um, as much as possible from, from our home. Um, the second um, thing that might be helpful is to almost imagine that your worries um, can be allocated into two separate piles. 
The first pile is for those worries or concerns that are problems that currently exist for you right now, right in this moment. So, for example, I need to go and get groceries. We've ran out of food, um, but I know going to the supermarket puts me at increased risk. Um, you know, I miss my friends terribly and I want to catch up with them, but I know that that's too risky for me to do that. Um, and then the second pile is the worries that don't currently exist right here, right now, um, but they're worries that may or may not happen in the future. So, for example, what if I contract coronavirus and need, need ICU or ventilator support and there aren't enough ICU beds or um, what if someone living with me contracts coronavirus and brings it home and, and infects me? So these are things that haven't really happened right now and right in this moment, but they're things that potentially could happen in the future. So I suppose we're focusing on worries that are that are real in this moment and ones that we could potentially um, generate solutions for versus worries and concerns that um, haven't actually happened yet and are more kind of um, future oriented worries that we can't really control and can't really necessarily come up with solutions for. So the last thing is, well, how do we sort of respond to these worries from the two different piles? I think if there are things that really are happening for you right here, right now, we need to generate a list of solutions. And that can be really hard to do when we're really stressed and anxious. So drawing on support people, friends and families, um, and I'll talk a little bit about some support uh, volunteer support services that might be able to help. So can we access a neighbour to get groceries for us? Can we utilise friends and family, um, you know, to to come and, and help us out? Can we connect with people um, from our front yard? Can we sit on our porch and have our friends or family um, talk to us over the fence from, from the footpath or the car? So um, thinking about what we can do with some of these um worries and problems. And then for ones that are out of our control that aren't really happening to us right now, so ones that are more um, directed at things that may or may not happen in the future, we really want to shift our attention from this inner world, so all of our thoughts and feelings and how our body's responding. Um, we want to shift our attention from that to our physical body, so slowing down our breathing pressing our feet into the ground, pressing our hands together, stretching our body. So this is something that we can control. We can control how we move our body. Um, and then shifting our attention from our physical body to the outside world. So a quick way to do that is to think about the five senses, and some of you may have heard about that strategy before, but it's tuning into five things that we can see in our environment and describing that in a lot of detail, four things that we can um, hear, three things that we can touch, two things that we can smell, and one thing that we can taste. So we're really moving our attention away from worries in the future that we can't really control in the moment and back into the present moment, into our physical body and then into the external world. And that can really help train our attention to move um, back into the present and away from kind of those future worries and concerns. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Lauren. Tara, I might throw to you for the next one. For um, for some of the people that might be watching or some of the people out there that, that might be at a bit, a bit more of a higher risk, um, what what would um, what would it, I suppose what would it look like for for people that are that are exhibiting um, thoughts or behaviours that might be exacerbating or or um, in, increasing their level of anxiety in a in a in a not I suppose a in a in a, in a not so positive sort of way. Yeah, definitely. Those uh, who are currently having or have had treatment for cancer are quite in tune with their body and obviously want to do everything that they can to remain safe and healthy. And this is similar for parents caring for a child who again are having or have had treatment for cancer. They become acutely aware of changes in their child's eating, sleeping patterns, or behaviour. And the stress and anxiety associated with wanting to avoid contracting a virus such as COVID-19 can result in people constantly seeking reassurance that they themselves or their child are safe. And this may include frequent googling of symptoms, watching the news or frequently checking for social media updates, additional GP visits, checking body temperature multiple times a day, 
getting for other viral symptoms, or also intensely monitoring the symptoms of others. And while this feels fairly intuitive and to some degree is helpful, engaging in these behaviours excessively can actually increase or maintain fear and anxiety. And so what we would really recommend is that individuals try to slow down their rate of checking news or social media, ideally limited to once a day. I know that can be really difficult. But be careful not to allocate too much time to COVID discussions when you're with others. And also to seek to establish a plan with your oncologist or your GP about what symptom checking and management is really appropriate for you at this time. Excellent. The Probably the, the last one's a, a question for you both. I'm sure people watching this out, out there will be um, keen to get some, get some ideas about where where, where they can turn if, if, if there's extra extra support um, that they that they might need or a loved one or a family member might need in this space. Do you, do you want to run through the um, um, the services that are out there to to support people in in this time? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and the good news I think for many people is that there are a few services and schemes that have been um, introduced and funded as a result of the coronavirus. Um, so for private, for accessing a private psychologist, for example, many psychologists are now offering telehealth, but there's a new Medicare scheme that for individuals who are vulnerable or immunocompromised, for example, or have a chronic illness, um, are actually bulk billed for all telehealth services. So this means people can access um, a private psychologist from home um, and utilising telehealth with no out-of-pocket expense to them. Uh, a good way to find a psychologist if you're not linked in with someone and not sure where, where to start. The Find a Psychologist website um, lets you enter your suburb, lets you enter, um, you know, that they, the telehealth is a search criteria and also chronic illness or cancer to try and find a psychologist who has experience in the area who offers telehealth. Um, trying to find someone that's not too far away in case you want to continue with them after um, telehealth wraps up when, you know, when the coronavirus um, scheme comes to an end um, might be a good idea. But I think in the short term, if you feel like you need support, then accessing support via telehealth with the private psychologist is a great opportunity. Um, Beyond Blue is working on a coronavirus mental health support services. That's not up and running as of yet, but I, I don't think that will be too far away. But in the meantime, they have their usual uh, 1300 number three telephone online counselling, as does Cancer Council Victoria. Um, Gather My Crew is a great support service because that's a group of volunteers who might be able to do some of these things that um, you're not feeling overly comfortable to do, for example, picking up scripts and going to supermarkets. Um, they also can provide social connection and support. So if you're living at home and don't have friends and family nearby, this might be a good opportunity to get some of that help, um, you know, without you having to leave home necessarily. Uh, Canteen um, also provides support for children um, and young adults age 12 to 25 who um, have had or are having treatment for cancer as well as their siblings and they also offer support for parents via online phone and email counselling that's also free. Um, accessing prescriptions, there's a new coronavirus um, scheme that will come properly into effect in May 2020 but actually allows pharmacists to dispense medications um, without people needing to attend the pharmacy. So they can use e-scripts um, sent to them from the GP and then actually post the medication out to patients. There are some exclusions based on the script, but um, that might be something worth talking to your GP or pharmacist about. Um, we do sometimes see, or you know, there's been a little bit of um, evidence that um, with everybody living at home in close confines, that can be quite stressful and can lead to increased stress um, between family members, um, increasing risk of violence and abuse. So the 1-800-RESPECT number um, also offers free support and counselling. You Can Connect is also a great service for young people aged 15 to 25 who can log on and access um, 
contact details for a range of other people in that age group to have social connection and, and chat with um, online and via telephone. And Lifeline is a 24 hour, seven days a week telephone support service that's free for anybody who needs more um, urgent, I suppose, or after hours telephone counselling support. So a few options there, I think. Um, some people will be aware of, some aren't necessarily new, but some of those, um, you know, are specifically tailored to help people access mental health support from home um, with no out-of-pocket expense to the person, which is great. Fantastic. That's a, a, a really comprehensive list. I'll probably add a couple of our um, Leukemia Foundation internal support services there as well. So our, we have a number of digital channels, including private Facebook groups that people can join as well to access information and moderated support. Um, and our, also our 1-800 number, 1-800-620-420. So if, any, if anybody's out there that's watching this and, and, and might just need a little bit of help trying to navigate how to either connect with a psychologist that might have have a have a particular interest, knowledge, or skill in 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 this area. Then I'd really encourage you to to call our one hundred number and connect with one of our blood cancer support coordinators. Um, uh, lastly, a really big thank you for everyone here at the Leukemia Foundation for for both of you for giving up your time today. You're both frontline health professionals, and we're amazingly appreciative of 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 giving up your time today and all all the work that you're doing in in helping our our blood cancer community. So an, an enormous thank you um, to you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's been a great opportunity for us also. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thank you.